Around six months ago, I was uh, browsing Amazon when I discovered the lowest rung on the literary ladder. Video game novelizations. It never ceases to amaze me just how big the novelization business is. Seriously, scroll through the citations on any Star Wars wiki page to get an idea of just how deep this rabbit hole goes. It's a big network, and games are certainly caught in it. After all, games have a fetish, and arguably a need for creating a rich fictional universe. Games have room for stories that might be better suited for the more deliberate pacing of a book rather than the repetition and the ultra-violence of gameplay. And game novelizations have taken off a few times. I saw all those dang Halo books all over my high school cafeteria back in the day. They were New York Times bestsellers. But for this video, I decided to read a few video game novelizations that people probably don't remember as well. After all, they can't all be good if there are simply that many of them. And they uh, don't exactly take a long time to read. First up is Hitman Enemy Within, published by the Universe Expanding Specialists at Del Rey. The author, William C. Deitz, also has his name on novelizations from the Mass Effect, StarCraft, and Halo franchises as well, so uh, he should be pretty good at this stuff, right? Maybe not. I hope you like reading paragraphs about Hitman eating food, because that's what he does in this book. The first half of this book never fails to mention what Agent 47 had for breakfast that day. It makes a point out of it. It's got this adorable juxtaposition between trying to be all serious and gritty about him assassinating people, but then it switches modes to talk about how shy and lonely he is while he tries to find a decent meal. The assassin ordered wild salmon and a glass of ice water, then settled back to wait. It was dark outside, so there was nothing to do but watch the people sitting around him. He drove to the local Denny's restaurant, which in the absence of a mom and pop option would have to do. After a grand slam breakfast, it was time to return. Here's a fun game. Look up a frilly restaurant review in your local newspaper and rewrite it to be about Agent 47 eating breakfast. Congratulations, you have now written about a quarter of Hitman, Enemy Within. They're trying to flesh out Agent 47 as an actual human being here. The book is still all James Bondish, with rival assassination organizations traveling around the globe, one-upping each other with incredible stunts, but then it diligently stops for a break every now and then to flesh out our main character. But then the second half of the book starts exhibiting the same problem that a lot of games do, where the content of the book gets incredibly darker without the tone of the book getting darker to uh, keep it consistent. The games had a sense of humor that kind of balanced out how reprehensible our hero actually was. You can kind of empathize with this horrible hitman when all your targets are worse people than yourself, but also because you share your own experiences with that horrible hitman firsthand. The book doesn't really have that luxury. The second half gets way more cynical and edgy with characters who are pedophile slave traders who suddenly waltz in in between paragraphs about how the agency's secret mansion base has mailbox that fold into SAM launchers. Most of the second half of this book is a long, tiring trek through the desert, and it's uh, not exactly the same fast-paced cheese of the first half. The book no longer becomes fun. It gets slow, boring, and tiresome, which is exactly the opposite of the next book. Back in the mid-90s, David Ab <laughs> and Brad Lenaweaver managed to do the impossible and turn Doom into a book. Not just one book, but four books. They made a classic new space opera out of Doom, and I somehow ended up with part two. So the basic setup is that we have a Doom guy space marine who has a female sidekick with him. From what I gathered in the intro, it sounded like the previous book had Doom guy and Doom girl kill every last alien demon that tried to invade their Martian moon base. Which might not be super interesting to read about, but that's basically what happens in the game. So in the second book, they now have to deal with the more pragmatic issue of being left alone in that abandoned moon base. They're running out of air and food while surviving off recycled water as they steadily go insane and hallucinate from the loneliness and solitude and existential horror of deep space isolation. Which, uh, still fits the theme, I guess. They spend the weeks assembling a rocket to fly back to a demonically overrun Earth, where they touch down in the desert outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. Okay. Now they're just venturing into uncharted territory. 
As they explore the post-apocalyptic wasteland, Doom Guy and Doom Girl discover the last bastion of humanity barricaded inside the headquarters of the Mormon Church. Okay, so here's the deal. Like, Earth is overrun by demonic aliens, right? The last remaining governments on Earth are either mind-controlled or are cooperating with the aliens. So it's up to survivalist Mormons to save planet Earth from the non-believers. It gets, like, legit creepy about it halfway through. Doom Guy goes to bed at night reading the Book of Mormon and quoting relevant passages for us. It is so terribly close to almost being religious propaganda. I've looked up these authors, and I could not easily find a strong connection to Mormonism there, so maybe this part two of the classic Doom space opera saga doesn't have an agenda after all. Maybe it's just a weird surprise. But the most crazy, unpredictable, wild thing that I did not expect to come out of this book was that it was not actually half bad. <laughs> Like, that, that crazy Mormon stuff, it just comes straight out of left field, it's hilarious, I couldn't make that stuff up. But these guys did, and I had a hell of a fun time reading through this thing. So later on, Doom Guy and Doom Girl team up with a 14-year-old hacker kid and a fiercely religious Mormon sniper to cyber hack into some cyber thing to save humanity. While they wander out into the desert, they have long, introspective conversations about the philosophical implications of undeath or the sexual orientation of their childhood friends. They rub each other with rotten lemons to disguise themselves as zombies. They get into incredible amounts of trouble and miraculously manage to escape at the last possible second. Our heroes in here talk like they're fragile, but they act like they're indestructible. It's this fun, rollicking 80s adventure where likable characters get beaten around and tattered all over the place and almost die so many times, but they just keep going, which is also what happens in this next novelization. Metal Gear Solid. This one comes to us from the pen of Raymond Benson, who also wrote novelizations for James Bond and Splinter Cell, as well as a handy reader on Jethro Tull. But for this book, maybe they gave him too much credit. It's easy to forget just how wordy of a game Metal Gear Solid was, which gave this author an opportunity to take the easy road and rip the game's script straight into the book. It is verbatim. The conversations in this book are almost copy-pasted. They follow the beats of the game script to a T. Barely anything has changed at all. I don't know what happened. I just couldn't pull the trigger right away. I never had any problems in training. But when I thought about my bullets tearing through those soldiers' bodies, I, I hesitated. Shooting at targets and shooting at living, breathing people are different. Ever since I was a little girl, I always dreamed about being a soldier. Every day of my life, I've trained my mind and body for the one day when I could finally see some real action. And now... So what now? You want to quit? I can't quit. It's even weirder when the author goes out of his way to describe the level design, the guard movements, the nuances of Snake's moves, and even the loot Snake picks up along the way. It's like reading a text-based Let's Play of the game on a forum thread. The only time Raymond Benson uses some of his own creative liberties is when he has these characters doing something awfully out of character. Like when Snake punches out two guards and quips, Merry Christmas. I forgot to tell you, Christmas is early this year. Despite all benefits of the doubt I tried to give it, it seems like Metal Gear Solid as a story does not translate into a novel as smoothly as everyone expected it to. You can almost hear the author's defeated frustration with this game's story before he just accepts it and copies down yet another block of words. Do you think love can bloom even on a battlefield? That's a really stupid question, Otacon, but to give you an answer. Yeah, I do. I think it, it might also be worth mentioning that the snake in this book brutally murders just about every guard he doesn't even cross paths with. This is an incredibly weird example of a game novelization that actually has a higher body count than the game it's based off of. I hated it. I, I wanted this to end. I... I, I I don't even know why I bothered. I, I spent seven hours this previous Sunday reading this book from one cover to another cover, and that's about how long it takes to rush through the game. And you get the same experience either way. It's the same script in both of them, but uh, this is worse in every conceivable way. 
How the hell do we live in a world where a book based on Doom makes for better light reading than a book based on Metal Gear Solid? <laughs> how does that happen? I've thought about it. I think I know how. I think I know why. It's because Doom doesn't have as much of a story to begin with. That gave them creative freedom to embrace their own strengths. And as professional authors of novels that don't have to worry about pesky gameplay and player interaction mucking up the story, these authors probably had a better idea of how to craft a more entertaining story than Doom's game developers did. The Metal Gear Solid book does not expand or reinterpret its universe. As a fan, it is useless to me. It just recites the game all over again. One could say that this book is not original content. It feels like Raymond Benson watched someone else play the game for a few hours, took notes, and then elaborated on those notes in between entire blocks of unaltered script. At least that's better than just not playing the game at all, looking at the box art, reading the back cover, and making up the rest as you go along. Cause that might as well have been how they made the Worlds of Power version of Metal Gear. Worlds of Power was a series of NES game novelizations made way back during the George H.W. Bush years. The concept was drummed up by career entrepreneur Seth Godin as a way to get his kids to read books. He wrote them under the pen name of FX9 so that kids might find it in the Nintendo section of a bookstore. And since they were made for children, that meant airbrushing out the guns and the violence. Literally, Snake has no gun on the cover. He's just putting up his dukes in a stealth defense pose. He's ready to punch out whoever approaches him from whatever direction he's not facing. This book also smells really bad for some reason. So let's see what's inside. Snake's name is Justin Haley. He's part of a group called the Snake Men. The mission comes from Commander South, head officer of Foxhound Command, the military unit controlling the Snake Men. What the hell's going on here? This is only page one, and come on, everyone knows Foxhound is one word all capitalized. The American localization of Metal Gear 1, the NES version, is now infamous for contradicting the future canon of the series, but this book just takes it to a whole new level of insanity. Big Boss doesn't show up at all, instead the bad guy is Vermin Katafi, whose brutal regime terrorizes the small nation of Noria. Solid Snake steadily becomes a walking arsenal of deadly weapons, but all the action scenes have him pistol-whipping bad guys unconscious, sneaking out of danger at the last possible second, or pretending to be a, a cat. What the hell am I doing with my time? This is embarrassing. I am a grown-ass man, and this was made for seven-year-olds in 1990. It was cynical book fair fodder. It was a blatant attempt at further commercializing a commercialized product kids were interested in. It was a way to get kids to read something, anything, even if it was schlock, so that they could make merchandise out of it. It just had the same name as a popular video game, and that's all it needed, right? This is patronizing. This kind of manipulative, licensed edutainment is just a painful reminder of how commoditized childhood is. Was, was it even legit? It looks like they got the license to use the IP from Konami, but Nintendo wanted to stay the hell away from this stuff. But I mean, it has passages like this. What sane parent, teacher, or any other caregiving individual would force this following passage onto a child? They were trained killer scorpions. Katafi used them to destroy his enemies, and now they were coming at him. Poisonous stings held high in the sting position. So, uh, enough said. Oh god, I can't do it. Doom was awesome, light reading. Metal Gear anything was not. That is weird, isn't it? These were trained killer scorpions. Katafi used them to destroy his enemies, and now they were coming at him. Poisonous stings held high in the sting position. <laughs> Why? <laughs>